today we're actually on page 189 and for those who are just coming for the first time we may well be on the very last session of this particular uh book or there may be two more to come who knows or one more to come it depends how much discussion we have and how much we can just go through fairly quickly and it's been incredibly rich we've had these discussions going on for at least two years just on this little book uh which if you read you can read fairly quickly but it really does help to um relate the buddhist teachings to our lives and to see how we can glean some wisdom in an applicable way so um this is not so much a sort of class where we're going to tell you how to understand this but it's more about you having the opportunity to discuss this together and to have some reflections from us where um, that seems possible. <laughs> I can't promise it will be very possible today because this is about monarchy and about um, patriarchy. And I must say, I'm not super keen on that, but I think there's a lot of demo and a lot of principles in there that are interesting for us all. Plus, I'm a little bit tired. With uh, We've had four days of plumbers around here fixing uh, lots and lots of things, hopefully. And uh, tomorrow I'm giving a retreat in Oxford as well. So uh, we'll see how we go. And I think Venerable Rebecca was uh, talking on this last week and apparently you got into discussing what makes a good leader. Maybe you talked about what makes a bad leader as well. Um, and today we might go further with that. So uh, basically I'll read through the whole of the first couple of paragraphs because I don't really understand it very well <laughs> and some of the Dhamma part as well maybe yeah maybe a whole page or so and then we can pause and we can discuss and if there are any Dhamma questions related or not you're very welcome to ask and if at any time you have uh, a comment to make you can raise your hand and I'll come to you either immediately or at a suitable time you can also ask questions in the chat box as well so we only record ourselves um but if you do ask a question verbally your voice will be on the record so we try not to mention you by name but uh it's lovely for people to hear from from others you know especially for the lay folks in our community to hear from each other so um please feel very free to join in <clears throat> so this is called the monarch's duties on page 189 we do have a monarch here, actually, now. I don't know how many other people have such things as kings and queens and princes and princesses. But uh, <laughs> seems rather outdated, but we do have one here. <laughs> here we go. So the Buddha is relating a story of the distant past. <clears throat> King Dalhanami sent for his eldest son, the crown prince, and said, my son, this sacred wheel treasure has slipped from its position. And I've heard that when this happens to a wheel turning monarch, which really means someone with a lot of power, um, he has not much longer to live. I have had my fill of human pleasures. Now is the time to seek heavenly pleasures. You, my son, take over control of this land. I will shave off my hair and beard put on the okra robes and go forth from the household life into homelessness. And that is a very often repeated little um, phrase that you'll find in the suttas, which indicates that somebody wants to go forth as a monk or a nun. And obviously this was something that was understood at those times. And that's why um, it was understood what that meant. And uh, yeah, even today in India, in spiritual India, people have this idea that their lifespans are sort of divided up into kind of childhood, which actually, according to Indian medicine, lasts until you're 30, <laughs> where you're trying to kind of learn and, uh, you know, get skilled in the world and maybe start a family. And then you have youth, which is 30 to 60, pretty cool. And that's when you're kind of having the family and uh, working and, you know, uh, providing and contributing to society. And then the last part of your life is older age. And I'm not sure if they split this into three or four. But anyway, the last either third or quarter, probably, 
is when you live your spiritual life. So you wait until you've got almost no energy left and you've got so much world weariness and so much little energy, actually, that all you can really do is sit down and fall asleep in your meditation. So <laughs> this is not really to be advised and it doesn't work in um, monastic communities today. So we tend to uh, encourage people to try and go forth in the prime of life. Uh, it makes it very difficult once you've had a family. Many people think, well, when the kids are grown up, then I can, you know, ordain. But when the kids have grown up, guess what? They have kids and you have grandkids <laughs> and then you want to be part of their lives and then they have great grandkids. And okay, we had some visitors the other day who had something like six great, great, no, yeah, great grandchildren, great grandchildren, two twins on the way, two other great grandchildren on the way. <laughs> so here he is having done what he wants to do in the world and feeling satiated with that and now there's nothing more to do but to go forth and having installed his eldest son in due form as king king dalhanemi shaved off his hair and beard put on okra robes and went forth from the house called life into homelessness and it did mean into homelessness not into a beautiful monastery where all your food was provided this was a pretty austere way of life and seven days after the royal sage had gone forth, the sacred real treasure vanished. So according to the superstition, they thought that this real treasure, whatever it was, it was some kind of um, treasure, you know, some kind of form of wealth that the king had, some kind of um, token of yeah, symbolic power or wealth or something like this. It had vanished, so only that meant that he should die now. Then a certain man came to the new king and said, Sir, you should know that the sacred wheel treasure has disappeared. At this, the king was grieved and felt sad. He went to his father, the royal sage, and told him the news. And the royal sage said to him, My son, you should not grieve or feel sad at the disappearance of the wheel treasure. The wheel treasure is not an heirloom from your father's. But now, my son, you must turn yourself into a noble wheel turner. And then it may come about that if you perform the duties of a noble wheel turning monarch, on the opposite day of the 15th, when you've washed your head and gone up to the veranda on top of your palace for the opposite day, that's the day of observing eight precepts, the sacred wheel treasure will appear to you. Thousand spoke, complete with rim, bob, and oral accessories. Hmm. So this is a story from the past, so it seems rather mythological and maybe difficult to understand. I can't say I really understand this, but it seems to me that the significance here is that the real treasure is when we're not just a world-turning monarch or wheel-turning monarch, in other words, not just a... Uh, we don't only have worldly power, but we actually renounce that worldly power and become what's called a noble wheel turner. And you might remember that in the Buddhist suttas, especially in the first sutta that the Buddha gave called the Dhamma Chakra, Pavatana Sutta, the Buddha turned the wheel of the Dhamma. Yeah. He set in motion a wheel that was going against the stream of the world and it could never be turned back. He said, you know, in that sutta that the wheel has been set in motion, it cannot be turned back. In other words, once the Dhamma starts to spread, it will continue. And once you hear the Dhamma, you can't forget it. Yeah. So this is the real, um, if you like, the power in a human being that, you know, they hear the Dhamma and they become noble. This is something really worthwhile. So there are different duties involved with a noble person, which have nothing to do with wielding power over others. So then this psalm says, what, sir, is the duty of a noble wheel-turning monarch? <clears throat> so this is somebody who rules righteously. It is this, my son, relying on the Dhamma, honouring the Dhamma, esteeming and respecting it. With Dhamma as your standard, your banner and sovereign, you should provide lawful protection shelter and safety for your own dependents. 
you should provide lawful protection, shelter and safety for the katyas attending on you. They're the kind of, um, what do you call them? Kind of, not the merchants though, the warrior caste? The warrior caste. So I suppose in a way the army actually, another kind of army. For your army, for the Brahmins and householders, for the inhabitants of town and countryside, for ascetics and Brahmins, for the beasts and the birds. That's nice, isn't it? Because they don't necessarily say that in all religions, that we should provide safety and protection. Sometimes we're taught to kind of rule over them and that it's okay to subjugate them to our will. Let no crime prevail in your kingdom. And to those who are in need, give well. To those who are in need, give well. This is really beautiful too, because often in Buddhist suttas, or let's say in Buddhist countries, actually, people think that they should only give to those who are really worthy. You know, to maybe people who are fully enlightened and everybody can proclaim that they're fully enlightened to gain wealth. Um, but the Buddha's not saying that. Here, they're talking about giving wealth wherever it's needed. So without much regard for, for the, the recipient, other than that they are in need. And certainly without much regard for whether it's going to benefit you, right? Because sometimes it can be a bit like, where do I get more bang for my box? <laughs> where do I get most merit, most brownie points that I can put in my comic bank account? <laughs> so I get a good rebirth. And that is a little bit self-interested. So this is really beautiful. I think it's quite nice. And whatever ascetics and Brahmins in your kingdom have renounced the life of sensual infatuation and are devoted to forbearance and gentleness, each one taming themselves, each one calming themselves, and each one striving for the end of craving. From time to time, you should approach them and ask, what, venerable, is wholesome and what is unwholesome? What is blameworthy and what is blameless? What is to be followed and what is not to be followed? What deed will in the long run lead to harm and sorrow and what to welfare and happiness? Having listened to them, you should avoid what's unwholesome and do what is wholesome. That, my son, is the duty of a noble wheel-turning monarch. <laughs> ha! This would be great. I should send this to King Charles. How to become a really good king. Wouldn't this be wonderful? I don't know if the, the royalty have that much power in our countries, but uh, maybe any leader in a position of leadership would do well to practice these principles. To give protection, lawful protection, if you are in that position. Shelter and safety for one's own dependents. In other words, we're actually caring for them. We're not exploiting them. And then special protection for those who are actually looking after us, right? With a sense of gratitude. And for all inhabitants, whatever they're standing in society, whether they're from the higher caste, the lower caste, whether they live in the town or the countryside, Aesthetics and Brahmins, that means every religion, because the Brahmins were the kind of um, religious people of the land, whereas the ascetics were, I mean, certainly under the Buddha, they kind of spurned religion. They were just summoners, and summoners meant homeless ones. It meant those in search of the truth. So this idea of monastics being Buddhist, to me, is still rather strange. I more identify as a summoner than as a Buddhist because it was actually a sort of um, rebellion from religious convention. It was a search for the truth. It was an inward journey. And it still is. You know, the Buddha's path is asking us to look for ourselves. What is wholesome? What is unwholesome? How do we know? How can we sense that in our bodies, in our minds, and in the way we respond to life and to other beings? So this is really wonderful. So this person's job is to protect those around them. And yes, they can approach the, um, the ascetics. And here I think it is talking, uh, let's see, whatever ascetics and Brahmins have renounced the life of sensual infatuation and are devoted to forbearance and gentleness, each one taming themselves, each one calming themselves, and each one striving for the end of craving 
See here, it doesn't say they're Buddhist or they're Hindu or they're any other particular sect. It's what they're doing that makes them worthy of being approached. It's what they're doing that, you know, determines whether they're wise or not and worthy of approaching because we don't just approach anyone, right? There's this uh, idea in some cultures that if you ask questions, you're being disrespectful. <laughs> and, you know, it's cultural, right? And that's really how it's seen. But in my upbringing anyway, I only ask questions of people who I respect. Like to actually ask questions of somebody means that you value their opinion. You know? You're interested in their response. You think maybe you can learn something from them. And I mean, every child probably asks a lot of questions of their parents because they look up to them so much. You know, if you have the fortune to be able to ask your parents, if you have good enough parents or available enough parents, then um, the child will ask, why, 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 why? <laughs> Which might drive them mad, but still, it's a sign of respect. So, uh, yeah, we first look at the qualities in a person. Have they renounced a life of sensual infatuation? So this does mean that they are renunciates devoted to forbearance and gentleness devoted to it doesn't mean they are always forbearing and gentle but they're devoted to cultivating those qualities inside each one taming themselves calming themselves striving for the end of craving so they might not be enlightened yet but they're sincere on the path and if someone says they're enlightened but they still have craving they don't fall into this category it's the actions that determine where we are on the path. So these are all principles of Dhamma. You know, the Buddha taught that craving is the cause of suffering, and that's really the one we have to seek to end. So from time to time, we should approach them and ask, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blameworthy? What is blameless? These are great questions. This is basically about ethics. Right? how to live a good life, what is to be followed, what is not to be followed. Another really strong theme in the suttas, and it's actually a part of right view, being able to discern right from wrong, what to follow, what not to follow. So many people are following things that lead only to their harm, you know. Even with good intentions, you might take a teacher and think, I'll follow this teacher, and then you find that their conduct's really faulty. And it's such a terrible loss of faith you know one of the most tragic things that can happen is to have faith in a teacher and to entrust yourself to them you know to entrust yourself to their guidance and then to find that actually they're corrupt in some way this is very very harmful to the dhamma for a long time to come i'm talking about in some major way right i'm not saying you might find out they're not perfect but you might find out they're involved in abuse or you know not protecting the people around them, right? Maybe exploiting and not overcoming craving, but maybe involved in craving. And then what deed will in the long run lead to harm and sorrow? And what to welfare and happiness? I mean, listen to them. You should avoid what's unwholesome and do what is wholesome. That, my son, is the to the noble will to anyone. Notice here that it says, what deed will in the long run lead to harm and sorrow and what to welfare and happiness? And uh, this just sticks for me now because tomorrow I'm teaching about Vedana in Oxford, about feelings, um, pleasant, unpleasant, mutual feelings and different kinds of feelings. And sometimes we're so obsessed with following the pleasant feelings that we don't really ask, is this actually leading to our happiness in the long run? right? Maybe it feels good now, but is it cultivating wholesome states? Similarly, are there some sensations, some feelings that are unpleasant now, but might actually lead to wholesome results in the future? An obvious example of that is something like restraint, sense restraint, or maybe attempting to keep the precepts, which perhaps in the beginning feels like a little bit of a uh, sacrifice, but later on you realize there's a purity, there's a clarity it brings to your mind. And, uh, and it's not actually a sacrifice at all. It's a path to freedom. It's a path to peace. 
So uh, I'd like to pause there because I think there's some really important questions and I wonder if anybody has anything to say on this or ask about this, or maybe you could say what you think are some examples of deeds that in the long run might lead to harm and sorrow or in the long run <clears throat> would lead to happiness and welfare. How do we know? How do we know? I'm noticing that there was a couple of messages. I'm just going to check if they're actually questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, great. Okay. So firstly, going right back to the beginning, Minori said that um, from Wikipedia, the Ben Becker said that, she said, we should just check it on Wikipedia. <laughs> Buddhism adopted the wheel as a symbol from the Indian mythical idea of the ideal king called the Chakravartin, a wheel turner or a universal monarch who was said to possess several mythical objects, including the Ratna Chakra, the ideal wheel. Should mean the jewel wheel. The Maha Sudasana Sutta, the Diganikaya, describes this wheel as having a nave or nabi. That nabi literally means like a belly button kind of thing. Uh, a thousand spokes, Sahasarani, Sahasarani, mm -hmm. and a feli or a nami. I have no idea what a feli is. All of which are perfect in every respect. Okay, so it's it's a take on that, and it's changing the kind of uh, ideas that were prevalent at that time and improving them to be ideas related to the Dhamma. So the Buddha often did this. Send it to the leaders of the main political parties. Yeah, the problem is, you know, it's not enough to just hear the Dhamma. You've got to have confidence in it. If everybody would just hear these things and then take them in, it would be wonderful. But unless it actually sinks in and we get that kind of spark inside, oh, hang on, this relates to me. Um, this is something that maybe I should listen to and you have a bit of trust in. It just doesn't work, but it'd be great, wouldn't it, if uh, political party leaders actually uh, did hear these things. I feel sorry for them because I think a lot of the time politicians may have very good intentions, but the nature of the role seems to be that a lot of compromise is needed. <coughs> Richard says, I always have asked questions out of respect to both of you Vens. <laughs> Meta. Yeah, that's right. We're very aware of that, which is why we encourage questions, you know. And uh, it's a privilege to be asked questions because it shows people's genuine sincerity and wish to learn the Dhamma. And, um, you know, even if you ask us questions, we might not always know, but it stimulates a discussion. And I think we can learn from one another. I particularly enjoy questions because it gets me to think and it gets me to think outside my own box. You know, if I always have to come up with talks and ideas and I'm just thinking around my own head. But if people ask questions, they put a different slant. So here we go. The questions are coming. And just to encourage you further, the Buddha said, those who ask questions are very intelligent in the next life. I'd say you're even intelligent in this. So uh, <clears throat> just one more from the chat. Sometimes it's said that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right, good intentions without wisdom, maybe. Good intentions without wisdom. I don't really know where, I mean, that's coming from Christianity, perhaps. And I mean, there, I don't know, maybe they think we have to just have faith and that's the best way to heaven, right? Mm. But uh, it's a bit different in Buddhism because good intentions actually usually arise, really good intentions arise from the right view. If they're really wise intentions, they are connected to understanding something about suffering. What were you going to say? Most of us have like... A little bit of good intentions, a little bit of delusion, and a yeah. little bit of greed. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't think there's such a thing as a perfectly well, there might be a perfect pure intention, of course, there is, but a lot of intentions are mixed. It doesn't mean you're going to hell, though. I think that's a bit rough. I actually disagree with that. I think good intentions are like a beautiful thing to have. And the more we intend in wholesome ways, the more our speech and behaviors tend to follow those intentions. But we do need wisdom. We do need wisdom. Um, there was someone with a hand up, but now it's not. I'll carry on reading from the chat and we'll come back to the one with a hand up in case you still want to ask. Uh, especially the politicians who used to attend retreats with Tree Ratner has said horrible things about refugees. I feel quite so sad for her. She's lost her way. 
Yeah, and that's clearly not good intentions to speak mean things about anyone. It's wrong speech. And unfortunately, if we are in positions of power and we have such wrong speech, it influences others as well. So I do think as leaders, as politicians, or as anyone in a leadership role, it's as though what we say has more power than what other people say because it's heard more widely. And that can go for the good and the bad. So it's so important to be careful around saying horrible things about anyone, things that discriminate, things that put others down. And if we do it, we have to apologise, right? <laughs> if we possibly can. Uh, yeah, she probably has lost her way. So I find the sentence relying on the Dhamma, honouring the Dhamma, esteeming and respecting the Dhamma as your standard, your banner and sovereign, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't it? It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Relying on the Dhamma, honouring the Dhamma, esteeming and respecting the Dhamma. That's exactly the point about it's not enough just to hear the Dhamma. To actually take it as our refuge to honour, esteem and respect it, to hold it higher than our own head in a way, hold it above our head. I guess that's what it means by banner. It's something that's here, you know, it's like a guide that's above and in front of us that's kind of propelling us in the right direction. Yeah, it's very inspiring. Interesting because usually we hold as a standard and banner and sovereign as the leader, mm. the mm -hmm. leader of the nation. Right. Thinking, but here, yeah, what they're saying, it's not the person. Yes, it's exactly. the Dhamma. Exactly. You don't rely on you. Yeah. Don't rely on anyone. Even don't yesterday, we were talking about this, right? And you were saying mm. you notice sometimes that tendency to want someone to save, to want a savior, mm. you know? And I think we all have that somehow. Mm. We want a savior to tell us what to do, mm. to kind of make everything better to give us our, mm. the unconditional love that maybe we haven't yet found in our hearts. And it's actually never found externally. It's found in the Dhamma. The Dhamma is something that's universal and applicable mm. to all. But we are, the, in a sense, Dhamma, in other words, causes and conditions manifest. Right? So whatever we observe is Dhamma. But, yeah, the good Dhamma is that that liberates, knowing how to live in line with the Dhamma. Hmm. I'm wondering if the Vedan at the ah, okay. Would you like to actually ask the question? Because so far people are going for the chat box, but that's just because I'm talking too much. But I'd love to hear voices, and I'm sure everyone else would too. It's up to you, but um I'll give you a moment. And if you would like to speak, trust me, once one person speaks, everyone speaks. It's just People don't like to be the first. It won't let you unmute. Okay, sorry. I have to press the button. If you have your hand up, I can unmute you, but you have to keep up your little hand. Yeah, thank you, Venerable. Great. Yeah, I'm just trying to distinguish because I feel a tension point in myself around this about like, oh, sometimes it can seem like I'm on the right track with something and then it's really deceiving, obviously. And um, I'm just wondering if that like, the Vedana that has that quality of like peacefulness, joyfulness, lightness to it is sometimes an indicator as opposed to like, you know, the joy that comes with excitement where it's like more, okay. more sensual or craving, even, even around those subtle feelings. So I'm just curious about that distinction and yeah. what about that. Great question. That's a really great question. I had, that is what I'm going to address tomorrow. And uh, I mean, at least partly. And uh you're quite right. There's a distinction that the Buddha makes. He says that all feelings are of three types, whether they're wholesome or unwholesome. They're pleasant, they're unpleasant, or there's some somewhere in between. But then he further um, classifies them as feelings born of sensuality, which is amisa feelings. So amisa, sukha, dukkha, and asukha, adukkha, which means... Uh, uh worldly pleasure worldly unpleasant feelings and worldly feelings that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant and then um unworldly feelings which are sometimes translated as feelings born of renunciation in other words not of the senses but of the dhamma the qualities of letting go 
And so peace and joy that arises in meditation is usually related to something you've let go of, some kind of relinquishment, some kind of letting go. And it's generally not so connected with sensuality. Sometimes it's still felt in the body in the beginning, but it gets increasingly born of the mind. And exactly that, it doesn't have the same agitation of excitement. Yeah. I mean, what I noticed in my early years of practice was that even pleasant sensations, like I suppose they must have been fairly worthy sensations, um, are somehow agitating. To be honest, even pleasant spiritual feelings can be a little bit agitating. Like in the beginning, they're coarser and later they get more refined, which is why the Buddha says that, you know, there's piti, which is like rapture. Then there's sukha, which is more like contentment. And, and well, actually before that, tranquility. Right. And then there's sukha. And then later there's equanimity, which is even more peaceful. So it's even less agitating than the piti and the sukha. Um, so, yeah, if it's peaceful and the joy is kind of the joy of having let go of something, then it's certainly on the side of um, wholesome happiness. And the Buddha says we can certainly encourage that kind of happiness and in a way it gives us a contrast to the other kind so we wean ourselves off the the grosser coarser forms of agitating happiness and get more of a taste for this subtle happiness but uh yeah i mean in the beginning it'll be probably a mix and it's okay when it's the agitation of excitement it's enough just to observe it and to be aware of it but i think the main difference is that one is to be cultivated and one is not you don't condemn it for arising, but you don't actually go out and cultivate it. So we try not to indulge in sensuality. And of course, that's more so for the case of monastics. You know? um, although usually that's a gradual process. It usually doesn't work if we kind of outright deny it to ourselves. Yeah. I'm just checking. I've got all the um, points in your chat box. Doesn't have something can sometimes be a pointer that we're heading in the direction of the Dhamma. Yes, I mean, one of the instructions the Buddha gave to, um, it was actually to um, um, Upali, the Venerable Upali, who was a barber, who ordained, uh, and became the master of the, um, of the discipline, the training rules for monastics. The Buddha said, whatever leads to um, a kind of disentangling and whatever leads to peace, whatever leads to insight is... The Dhamma, you can know that that is the Dhamma. So whatever leads to peace also leads to insight. Whatever leads to insight should also lead to peace. So it's definitely um, a pointer that we're heading in the right direction. And that's the beautiful thing about having this body and mind, that there's a kind of internal compass that shows us which way to go. Or is it something that can deceive us sometimes, like how we get attached to feelings of peace and crave for it? I think the feeling of peace that arises is usually wholesome. It's the craving that we then generate that make, that turns it into something unwholesome. It's not by itself unwholesome. But I think that when craving arises <laughs> for it, it's often an aversion to what's there now, isn't it? <laughs> it's often actually aversion to the, to the feelings we're having that are not so peaceful. So we have to uh, learn to accept whatever feelings arise. Yeah. But I do think there's less to fear from getting attached to peace, so to speak, than uh, being attached to sensuality and having aversion to a lack of peace. That's where we can work. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, Suzanne, great. Hi. Can did you get assigned to unmute? Not yet. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is um if there's a craving for peace, you know, the the peace that comes from from inside, you know, not from outside. Uh, is it is it possible to to be to uh to feel that peace if there's a craving for it? Or is it actually not possible? Right. Well, it's certainly possible to feel peace without craving. And I think the craving will spoil it. <laughs> you know, it might start off as quite peaceful, but then if we're kind of having craving towards it, we're relating to that peace in an unwholesome way. So the peace arises due to 
some good karma, like some kind of wisdom that you have that has enabled a certain letting go. But then the old habits of craving come up. And if that continues for a long time, it will eventually destroy the peace. But it's not to worry about that. That's just natural, you know, in the beginning, because we're not free from craving. So that is something quite natural. And it's almost as though we have to make those mistakes again and again in order to learn how to relate wisely to the peace. Um, and I think one thing that helps me is to realize that the peace is not mine. It's not um, some kind of entitlement that I have or something like some commodity that I can ask for on demand. It's almost like a gift. It's almost something that comes to me when I have the right attitude, when I have, you know, um, when I'm less demanding, when I'm easily content. That's when I can be at peace. I don't need to feel peace. I can just be content with what's there. And that is already a certain amount of peace. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Shirley. Can we come to Shirley? Actually, I think you said what I more or less said in a very nice way what I was going to say before I when I raised my, just after I raised my hand. I mean, I can't, we can't really crave for peace because um, we can't really want peace because peace is, is is the lack of craving, the lack of wanting, and just as you say, being content with what, whatever is. So when I'm sort of agitated, my mind just won't do what it, I want it to do or what I sort of think it's supposed to do in meditation, I just try and make, peace with that and sometimes I can make peace with that mm. and I wouldn't actually say I, it was I mean it's it's not the lovely peace that you get when the sort of meditation sort of goes well um but it's quite wonderful that you can actually give kindness and acceptance to to anything really and um then the unskillful states just sort of lose their power really yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, so it's uh, and I, I I I like to I like to sort of remind myself that meditation is about making peace rather than achieving peace. Right, right. I have to keep reminding myself of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't do it. I, you that's know, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so, to see these yeah. things as verbs rather than kind yeah. of yeah rather than things. Yeah. Except they're actually yeah. what we do, and then it makes it very immediate doesn't it it's not mm. something that's mm. going to happen later it's something mm. that actually but uh, it's hard because we want nice feelings right we, you know we want nice feelings we don't want sort of restlessness agitation and right. going into integrate spins we don't want right. it to do that and yet when we're at peace with agitation it doesn't matter anymore it doesn't matter no <laughs> <laughs> but it, no, it doesn't matter. And then it's so yeah. actually okay. Yeah. Not, yes, and it's then the feeling okay. changes too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the irony, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah this is how yeah. we change our so-called reality. It's not really fixed. Yeah. It's often conditioned by our relationship to it. Yeah. Yeah. Before I come to Liz, I just want to acknowledge the, the comment in the box about a retreat with Ajay Sachito. So please, yes, absolutely, Richard. Thank you very much. Please send my greetings and, uh, yeah, maybe let him know I would love to see him someday. Hope I see him again sometime. Yeah, he's welcome to visit too. <laughs> okay. We'll come to Liz. <clears throat> Me. I saw an example yesterday of letting go and being at peace with something which is, I'll tell you the story very quickly. I went on a, uh, on a hike and uh, in a beautiful spot and there was this guy there with a big smile on his face resting with an amputated leg and it climbed all the way and I kind of looked at him. We, we made eye contact and I said, you came here walking? And he said, yes. He said, oh, but the other, um, the other leg as well is gone. Oh, I said, I, I didn't know how to react. I said, you're managing very well. He says, 
I am very determined, he said. And he says, you know, once you've said, okay, they're gone, then you can progress. And I thought you should be Buddhist man, you know. <laughs> and it was this peace and this smile. Oh. As far as I know, it's not Buddhist, but I was very impressed because when it's letting go of, uh, I don't know, little everyday things, you know, but it's letting go of both your legs and being at peace with it and being able to smile about it. I, I was, I was very, very impressed. I told him. I said, I've got to say, you know, you have some things that I wish I had to that extent, you know. And he smiled. I, I, I was really impressed that it's not only the Buddhist who worked that one out, you know. Yeah, he had yeah. to. And it was a piece about him. It was a very beautiful spot above the sea and so on. And uh, he, he was there. He, he was happy. He was peaceful. And I thought, this is wonderful, you know. Yeah. 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 What an example. It's wonderful, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's a lovely example because you said a couple of times he's not Buddhist. And uh, I think that's the idea, isn't it? That, you know, the Dhamma is something we can experience. We have kind of an inner guide and we learn if we're observant. And maybe yeah. especially if you're in a position where, you know, something happens in life, maybe if it was an amputation, then he would have lost a leg at some stage right two two legs two i said oh crikey oh. i know yeah two legs and no, then I you know, know you have to go inside and and see okay how am i going to survive this like how am i going to use my mind in a way that frames it mm. in a way mm. that can lead to peace you know it's either that or you get depressed right and you feel that your life's not worth living exactly. sometimes it's that suffering that actually can lead to the peace but that's really it, impressive because it, it can go either way. Yeah. yeah, but exactly, because he told me, he said, you know, if I don't let go, he didn't quite explain it like that. Yeah. Then my life was over. Exactly. So I had to let go. Yeah. And yeah. I was very impressed by this yeah. reasoning and the, the peace and the ease with which he met my eyes, because mm -hmm. I've been a nurse for 20 years, and I was a teacher for 70 years, but I still got this nurse radar, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, oh, you know, it's really funny when you've oh. been, you know, in that job for yeah. such a long time. And uh, my eyes met his, and he could see that I was thinking, oh, my goodness, you know. And that's where he started explaining to me. Mm -hmm. I was in admiration. I told him as well. I said, congratulations. What a positive yeah. attitude and what an accepting attitude. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, yeah. I, I, I thought thank I was you. really, you know, yeah, thank you for, sharing. for meeting this man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully you can give us hope that this is yeah. possible for us. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just coming to the chat. Uh, there's another comment here about craving and peace. It's wonderful. Wow, we really got into the heart of this one. Huh? For me, wanting peace in my life, it is not about craving, but it's connected with necessity because otherwise I feel my mind is not fed properly with the right nutrients. I'm not sure this makes much sense as it's difficult to describe in words. Thank you all for the beautiful discussion. It makes a lot of sense, actually. It really does. It's um, it's almost as though, yeah, a necessity because the mind will go down, won't it, if it doesn't have any peace. I mean, we would literally go mad without any peace at all, you know. Somehow there's something in us that, and we're very fortunate because we have some guidance as to where to look. And, you know, obviously from the example that Liz just mentioned, sometimes people might not have, got that guidance I mean maybe they have we don't know what they've read right we don't know what the influences are that are around them but um yeah we're just very fortunate you know to have that pointer to look in that place because it is there it's available to see but not everybody's in a position where they have that um privilege in a way right you know if you're kind of searching for food or if you're like being blown up in a war then um I don't know if you can still have that capacity, you may, 
but you might not have the right conditions to uh, remind you about it. And that's why it's so important to have spiritual friends. But that makes a lot of sense. And it's great that you can um, sense that in yourself, you know. It's like there's uh, something inside you can trust, your own sort of compass. <laughs> I think we're all nourishing ourselves by coming here on this Zoom. That's why we come here. Beautiful. And you're nourishing each other too, which is even more beautiful. So it's really lovely to talk about this. Yeah. Each one striving for the end of craving. Yeah. Well, shall we continue? Is there anything you want to say about all of this? Or anyone um, else? No, it's interesting. Each one for themselves. Mm. And uh, it's not up to the wheel turning monarch to or mm. make people happy or make people see the Dhamma. Yeah. But it is each one does it for themselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and in a way, a way that wheel turning monarch, well, I say noble wheel turning mm. monarch is setting the example, right? Mm. In a way, providing the conditions for them to find yeah. it. Providing I think the that's the thing, isn't it? Is when we don't have the conditions, yeah. Yeah. it's very hard. It you know, yeah, the lawful protection, the shelter and safety. And that's what I was getting yeah. at with the last comment, you know. But we're very fortunate to have that because then we can look inside and look for that peace. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if only our political mm -hmm. leaders and world leaders could provide that, could see themselves mm -hmm. as guardians and protectors, then, yeah, maybe we could get on to thinking more about peace. It's very, very hard otherwise. Uh, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a question about um, the, you know, the difference of um, feeling, um, you know, joy that you call it pity, I think, mm -hmm. the joy uh, in the body, you know, that feels very pleasant. And and I, I just had this experience a few weeks ago, um, just uh, cuddling with a friend, you know, not the sexual way, but just, you know, we were uh, both... Uh, cuddling and I was just feeling uh really this very nice feeling you know inside of me and and I was like experiencing it is that uh as if my my mind that was going outside looking for for uh for something was just satisfied in this moment mm -hmm. and I became quiet and stopped looking and I'm wondering I was wondering is that the same joy that I'm feeling in meditation um, when I let go and uh, there's mm. no, uh, no, uh, it not, it's not coming from outside, but is it the same? Um, mm. You know, because my mind uh, became still because I was satisfied, you know, with yeah. becoming this, this cuddle and, uh, yeah. and in meditation, I let go and also have, have this feeling yeah. of joy. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, maybe for me, the question wouldn't be so much, is it the same, but is it wholesome? Is it leading to wholesome states? Okay. And I think it's connected. Yeah, I think it's connected. I think like harmony in relationships and good friendship and love between one another is certainly a foundation for, for practice, but it's also a kind of pity arising. I would say it's very similar. Whether it's caused by a hug or just being around someone you care about, you can certainly have feelings of pity. I remember having that with Venerable Hesapani sometimes, even though like we don't always come from the same place but I would go to occasionally to ask for advice and I just get this like PT coming over me and uh, actually I would often give her a hug at the end of asking whatever question or talking to her usually it was confiding something because I go to her as a nun about the Vinaya or something like this and I'd get this kind of feeling and it was very beautiful it was a sort of feeling of trust and connection and I think it's similar but of course, the difference in meditation is it's not involving another person. Mm -hmm. But I still think we can start off by bringing that feeling up, you know, if it is a wholesome feeling. If it's sensual, that's different. Like if there is sort of any danger, it could turn sensual. Maybe don't bring it up because then it can lead your mind in that way. But if it's only very pure, you can bring that up in the beginning of the meditation just in a way to make yourself feel, yeah, life is good. I am safe. There's love around me. You mm -hmm. know, people I really appreciate. and. And really allow that to sink in. And then it will refine in the meditation. So in that sense, I think all, all feelings are 
you know, we never have the exact same feeling time and again, but they can kind of be connected and they can be refined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Your friend. Your friend who got a hug from the Dalai Lama. Oh, yeah. You want to say? Without names. A friend of Vinabur Chanda's. Uh, She just told the story of uh, her being really having a problem at work, feeling miserable, yucky, whatever, just generally down and out, and somehow ended up at uh, with an audience with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and uh, what did he say to her? He said, he saw her. He didn't he say anything. Her. Didn't he say, why are you no, crying? He no. didn't say that. Mm-mm. Anyway, he, he, he gave her a hug. And she said, everything disappeared. She couldn't even think how she was being upset anymore. She tried to remember how she was feeling upset, but it just disappeared from her brain. So, yeah, <laughs> just reminded me of that story. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. yeah, of love, really. Yeah, yeah. unconditional acceptance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very important. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, shall we continue? Maybe we'll get through this little piece. And, uh, oh, scary this. We might finish the book. We've only got 20 minutes, though. We'll probably have 10 minutes left of the book next time. (laughs) Okay. So, yeah. So they go and they ask these questions. And having listened to them, you should avoid what's unwholesome and do what's wholesome. So this is the question, isn't it, for us to learn how to avoid what's unwholesome and do what's wholesome. And this is what we're doing every day. Don't expect that you'll always know the answers without making mistakes. (laughs) Sometimes you have to actually do what's unwholesome. I'm not encouraging you to, but sometimes it seems to be that we need to in order to learn that it was actually unwholesome and not to judge ourselves, but just to learn. So then this dutiful son says, yes, sir. And they performed the duties of a noble wheel-turning monarch, just like that. And so, in succession, six subsequent kings arose who became wheel-turning monarchs. Then the seventh king to arise in this dynasty did not go to the royal sage, his father and the former monarch, and ask him about the duties of a wheel-turning monarch. Instead, he ruled the people according to his own ideas. Sounds familiar? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> today's leaders and being so ruled the people did not prosper so well as they had done under the previous kings who had performed the duties of a wheel turning monarch yeah the power of leadership the king then ordered all his ministers and advisors to come together and he consulted them and they explained to him the duties of a wheel turning monarch And having listened to them, the king established guard and protection for his subjects. But he did not give wealth to the needy. And as a result, poverty became life. (laughs) So socialism rocks. (laughs) From the growth of poverty, theft increase. From the increase of theft, the use of weapons increase. This is sounding familiar. From the increased use of weapons, the taking of life increased, lying increased, divisive speech increased, and sexual misconduct increased. And on account of this, people's lifespan decreased and their beauty decreased. And there it ends. And that's kind of what we can see all around us, isn't it? Not in every country, but in many countries. I mean, especially those countries where the government don't help subjects and the citizens. You know, in countries where there is no social security, for example, there's a growth of poverty. There's more theft, there's more weapons because people feel things are unfair. Lying, divisive speech, the rich want to hold on to what they've got, the poor, you know, blame the others for what they've got, often the wrong people. And the whole thing goes, you know, really bad. It's almost as though when we break one precept, 
we break them all you know the mind kind of becomes depraved and and um, yeah it doesn't have any sort of standards anymore and it's true that poverty is a cause for um you know for for the loss of the precepts basic ethical standards just out of need sometimes you know we shouldn't judge so lifespan decreases and beauty decreases you can see how a person can look beautiful on the outside but if they open their mouth and say rotten things about someone else they suddenly turn very ugly you know there's something in a, a human being's appearance that is not only physical it's something that either shines or kind of looks I don't know, kind of wretched from inside So somebody's just asked a question. I think I have to tell you the answer before um, we get to the end of the book, <laughs> out of compassion. I'm looking forward to finishing the book, but not because there won't be more teachings, because I'm really craving, not craving, but looking forward to giving more teachings on deep sutras. I mean, these are deep too. This is all about social and communal harmony. And now we're on the last part of establishing an equitable society. So this is why it's very um, based in the world, practical um but yeah i would like to get into some kind of sutras that i really love i'm not quite sure how to do it yet whether i'll take just random sutras that i love or try to theme it i don't think i'll theme it too much because that's a lot of thought and planning and knowing my mind i'll become very if i'm going to give you know sutras on right view i'm going to give every single sutra on right view you know and like <laughs> it's going to take another two years so um i think i'll I might just choose some sort of, and each one may take more than a week to go through because the point is not, again, a lesson, it's a discussion. And I think this is a really, really precious opportunity because most sort of classes are not discussions, they're lectures. Um, and it's just lovely to bring these teachings to life. I think we remember them better. We we kind of, we go to more depth with each one you know, when we explore it together. So that's probably what will happen um whether that happens next week or probably in a couple of weeks then uh, we will see so shall we get on to the next one we've only got 15 minutes gosh we could go right through it and finish it i mean maybe next week we should actually go through the epilogue because maybe the epilogue will sum things up what do you think people mm -hmm. it seems a shame to finish it so abruptly mm -hmm. somehow we could do a little uh kind of uh epilogue session because anyway, I'm not going to have worked out a new sutta by next week. And then from then on, we can uh, we can choose some new ones. So I'll carry on, maybe? Hello? What do you think, people? We've only got 10 minutes. Would it be too rushed, or should we just go for it? Emmanuel's got to do I'm just going for it. Providing for the welfare of the people. Because <laughs> I have a feeling it will be similar, okay? The Blessed One told the Brahmin, Kuta Danta. I think that means like sharp teeth or something. Kuta. Well, that's, yeah, I know Something teeth. Brahmin, once upon a time, there was a king called Mahavijita. He was rich of great wealth and resources, with an abundance of gold and silver, of possessions and requisites, of money and money's worth, with a full treasury and granary. And when King Mahavijita, was reflecting in private, the thought came to him. I have acquired extensive wealth in human terms. I occupy a wide extent of land which I have conquered. Now, let me make a great sacrifice that would be to my benefit and happiness for a long time. And calling his chaplain, he told him his thought, I want to make a great sacrifice. Instruct me, venerable, how this may be to my lasting benefit and happiness. And this is a chaplain, so I don't know why he's addressing him as venerable. But anyway, obviously he respects him a lot. The chaplain replied, chaplain means like a priest. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Your majesty's country is beset by thieves. It is ravaged. Villages and towns are being destroyed. The countryside is infested with brigands. If your majesty were to tax this region, that would be the wrong thing to do. Suppose your majesty were to think, I will get rid of this plague of robbers by executions and imprisonment or by fines, threats and banishment. The plague would not be properly ended. 
those who survived would later harm your majesty's realm. However, with this plan, you can completely eliminate the plague. With this plan, I guess this is coming up. To those in the kingdom who are engaged in cultivating crops and raising cattle, distribute grain and fodder. Mm -hmm. To those in trade, give capital. To those in government service, assign proper living wages. Then those people being intent on their own occupations will not harm the kingdom. Your majesty's revenues will be great. The land will be tranquil and not beset by thieves. And the people with joy in their hearts, playing with their children, will dwell in open houses. <laughs> That's such beautiful imagery, isn't it? That's what you see in some poorer countries in Asia. And in some safer countries, I've just been to Norway and there's a very strong social welfare system. It's a rich country and people do well and they do kind of contribute. But the wealth is very evenly distributed. And one of the men there, he's a black man who's brought up in Ireland, actually. And he said that, uh, that he'd only gone there for a visit. But 24 year, years later, he still lives there. <laughs> and it's because he noticed that kids were walking to school. They were just walking at the age of like six or seven on their own and playing outside. And in that sense, the society was very, very safe. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it reminds me when it says ch playing with children, children dwelling in open houses, joy in their hearts. We don't have time for that anymore, especially when we're not doing well mm -hmm. in our livelihood, right? We're focused on just bare survival. There's no time anymore. And saying, so be it, the king accepted the chaplain's advice. Wouldn't it be great if they actually came to monastics and asked for advice and then actually accepted that advice? <laughs> Too bad if the advice is bad, but at least in this case, it was good. And saying, so be it, the king accepted the chaplain's advice. He gave grain and fodder to those engaged in cultivating crops and raising cattle. Cap capital to those in trade. Proper living wages, we talk about living wages here, to those in government service. Then those people being intent on their own occupations did not harm the kingdom. I can imagine they felt grateful, actually, rather than wanting to harm. The king's revenues became great. The land was tranquil and not beset by thieves, and the people with joy in their hearts playing with their children, dwelt in open houses. Ah. Mm. So the whole thing ended happily, which is really nice. And yeah, if you say that the Buddha's teachings don't touch on anything like how to live in society and that talking about that is political, I think it's incorrect because the Dhamma needs to be applied to every aspect of our lives, how we organize our societies the kind of leaders that we follow, you know, the kind of advice that we follow, how to judge whether somebody's of good character or not, and not just based on what they say, but how they act. Mm -hmm. All of this is very much part and parcel of, of the Dhamma. And um, the Buddha will never usually talk about individuals. He'll talk about principles to follow. Mm -hmm. And in that way, monastics aren't really meant to talk about, you know, which leader you should vote for or whatever, but we can talk about principles. You know, look for leaders who are kind, who are protecting their people, who are trying to distribute the wealth, etc. Um, those who are moral, upright, trying to end craving rather than engaging in, you know, sexual misconduct or greed or hoarding of wealth. Um, and who treat those, treat people equally. I like the fact that embedded in the first part that we read were all the different castes and they were sort of not in any order. They were just kind of all put in there. And also the, uh, you know, the householders and also the ascetics. So it's very, very inclusive. And uh, this is how we make an equitable society, I guess. So we train ourselves, we develop wise friendships, we overcome anger within ourselves, we try to work towards the end of craving. And then, you know, we, we treat all those around us properly 
And then that means we're more likely to elect good leaders as well. And those leaders themselves are hopefully going to be established in basic goodness and the principles of the Dhamma, knowing what is for our benefit and for our harm. And in the end, we also have to know for ourselves. You know, we can't just attribute all responsibility to the leaders <laughs> and blame other people. We actually have to look inside and see what we're doing with our situation, with our mind. So um, there ends the book. <laughs> I didn't actually expect to finish it today, but uh, wow, I feel like really celebrating this moment actually, because this has been like two or three years. I think I started this still during the corona pandemic, wasn't it? And it was the sort of graduation from me giving talks with a bit of, you know, sort of reference to bringing a whole group into more of an in depth study of the texts and I think that's always a good sign that we can go straight to the words of the Buddha and uh, and actually bring them to life for ourselves so this is wonderful um, I'm glad to uh, hear the comment from Emily there hang on are there other comments I've missed I'll just read through a couple of them and then we'll decide what to do next week shall we just going back to the climbing of the mountain, for me, having a severe chronic illness means letting go of climbing the mountain. Ah, the sim yeah, thank you for this. Yeah, you're referring to the story. Today, climbing the mountain might be getting out of bed, correct, driving, going to a friend's birthday celebration. Yeah. My question is, can I be peaceful with a not doing what I would like to be doing? Yeah, wonderful. I'm so grateful the Dhamma teaches me this. Thank you for saying that, because I think that relate, you know, other people here can relate to that too. And if not everyone can, everyone will have to do someday, because we won't be able to climb that mountain, you know? And in the end, it's all about our attitude, you know? That guy could have climbed the mountain and still been miserable, my, by the way. <laughs> you know, it may have been an outward accomplishment, but he may not have had any peace. But I think the part that was... Uh, you know, was notable there was not so much the mountain, but his attitude, you know, and his peace. So, yeah, I think we can develop that wherever we are. And wonderful. It is true that you're really inspiring. Thank you. That's a nice comment from Sherry there. And I think we all can, yeah, mm -hmm. agree. Because I, I really think, I mean, I have a chronic disease, but it's not that debilitating. But I think until I had anything like that, I had some pride and I had, you know, not really a personal experience of how much it takes to live with a chronic condition, mm. therefore not the respect that I would now have towards someone suffering mm. like that. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. With this powerful book of teachings coming to an end today, I feel so grateful for you, Venerable, for seeing us through these trying years. I feel like I've come far because of these teachings. I'm so grateful. Thanks. Oh, and honestly, I can't imagine my life without having done that, you know, without having been part of this community. I mean, any people could have turned up to the talks, but it was beautiful people. And we just developed such a lovely community online. And now that's translating into, you know, a real monastery in person too, but the Zoom group is just as important to me as it was. And although I have probably a bit less time, I do want to continue these Friday night um, sort of discussions because I think it's nourishing for me too and hopefully for the people in the monasteries as well. The monastery, singular. <laughs> We're not being more. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I guess, what do you think about next week? Do we need to go through the epilogue or should we just end it here and figure out what to do next week okay we need a vote and it's not really fair on the people who are not here and it's not really fair on me either because I'll probably choose what I think anyway. <laughs> but for those who have been coming would you like a kind of session of summing up or would you or should we just get on to some new stuff I just don't know how much energy I've got next week. Maybe you can choose one because I've just taught this week and I'm teaching again next week a day retreat in Bristol the following day. Yeah? Could you start us at next week? Yeah? I, I, I quite like the idea of an epilogue. Let's see what people think. Uh, how about I write in the chat 
epilogue and then I write in the chat no epilogue or new sutta and you put yes 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 you know you put your little heart or your little hand up okay but you have to do it anyway venerable either way epilogue because I'm not going to be um oh I've sent it to Matthias sorry <laughs> I need to send it to everybody hang on do it again Okay. Basically, I don't know that I'll be doing this next week because I've got a lot of uh, work this week. Uh, epilogue. Did I write epilogue once? You wrote news. I wrote epilogue. Yeah. Is that how you spell epilogue? Okay. So we got two for the noose, so two with a whistle. <laughs> Epilogue and possibly a free discussion. Oh yeah, with it. oh yeah, that sounds nice. Hmm. Oh, that's a really nice idea, Gunter. I think Gunter's given a third option here, which I think is a really nice idea. And because you've been with us for the outset, Gunter, I kind of feel like going with that. I think that's a lovely idea. Hmm. And it's tops. A free discussion. Yeah, that sounds lovely. You know what I would suggest then is actually to you can go in little groups as well, maybe, and just meet each other and just talk about what it's meant to you, and then we can come back to the main group. We could do that too. And if anyone doesn't want to do that, you can always opt out and you just wait in the main room. So I don't want to put you off, by the way. We'll see how it unfolds. Um, yeah, lots of people want the applause. Good. Okay. Great. I think that was great. Uh, because most of us here have been in this group for a long, long time. Um, yeah. yeah, we should write yeah. those words down. Epilogue, free discussion for a conclusion, what we experienced, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool, lovely. That's what we'll do next week. And in the meantime, and if tomorrow there's no meta meditation because we're teaching at Oxford Insight, and Venu's coming along. So unless she gets left behind, do you want to be left behind? Right. You'd like to come. Anyway, we can't. I don't think we've put it online. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So there's no meta tomorrow. Um and we'll have meta chanting on Wednesday evening, 5 30. It's a nice thing actually. It's just half an hour and we just chant meta, but it's I don't know, somehow very uplifting to be with a group. It's a little group. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Friday night discussion next week. Okay. And then, and then of course, Mark. Ajahn Brahmani is coming to England. If you can't come to England, we're hoping to live stream some of it. Thanks to Matthias, who will be here with us. <laughs> and then I'm also teaching an online retreat with Ajahn Brahm from the 18th to the 20th of June. It's three full days. It is midweek. We can't do it any other way because he's between Thailand and somewhere else. And there's just no way we can do it any other time. Um but anyway, that will be happening as well. That's always worth taking time off work for if you are fortunate enough to be able to. Because having an Ajahn Brahm is just like having a big teddy bear full of metta, but a wise one. I don't want to just, you know, put him down to the level of teddy bears. This is a wise being who may sometimes be kind of very jokey and whatever. But you can feel the energy even on Zoom. You'll just feel it's coming from a deep place. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yes, we're having the epilogue. There's the word epilogue everywhere. Mm -hmm. Lots of thumbs up. Epilogue and discussion mm -hmm. and personal account of what we experienced, maybe how we grew in the Dhamma, what 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 speaking about the Buddha's teachings means to us, why it's important, mm -hmm. or where it's not relevant, maybe, whatever. Great. <laughs> okay. And you're so, welcome to come even if you don't want to share, right? You don't have to speak. That's never a must. So, yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Venerable. And we finally, you know, completed the book. But, you know, but then that opened up so many people's desire to read the suttas. And so, you, <laughs> so, and, uh, uh, and I wanted to tell people, and it is such a lovely community, and uh, there was this discussion, questions, and to understand these teachings deeper. And uh, it's so wonderful to have you around. Um, today's with the discussion and all the other regular teachings in Anukampa, as you know, um, is offered on donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And... If you are able, um, please donate to Anukampa Bikuni Project. 
Um, go to the website and um, uh, in the donation page, you can do the donation. And with your generosity, Anukampa and Verbachanda and the future Bikunis uh, will provide, can provide the community much more teachings than like this. Valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, meditations, so many things. Um, and um, when you when you go to the website, um, there are other uh, there is another link for the needed items as well. If you want to um, give something um, specially needed, valuable at that time, you can do that. If you want to visit the monastery or if you want to give a dana that is a food donation you can uh, you can email to this ad email address and then discuss with them uh, you can even give a food donation a dana uh, remotely as well and i will put a link to the donation and then the events Events, Venerable Chanda said, and then also in the events page, you'll see there are many teachings that Venerable Chanda is doing. And uh, if you are able, you can you can get those teachings as well. And I will quickly put the event page, event link as well, so you can go and see. And we keep these links updated. So have a look on and off. And the best thing is to do is to subscribe to the newsletter. And uh, you will get all these details regularly with the newsletter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manoy. Just to uh, also remind people that there's a Vesak day, like Vesak is the Buddha's birthday, right? And enlightenment and all the rest. So it's a powerful day, the most important day in the Buddhist calendar. And we're having an online event from 4 to 6 p.m. BST. Yeah, that's right. Super. So Matthias has put up the registration link. You just click on it. It's free to register. And then you'll get a, a link. Once we approve you, you'll get a link and you can join. We'll have like a Dhamma talk and we'll have some guided meditation. We'll have some discussion and we'll also be able to take the pre refuges and precepts. So for anyone wanting to take like five precepts or even eight precepts, yeah, you've still got time to take eight precepts as long as you've not eaten lunch that, not lunch, as long as you've not eaten since one o'clock BST. So if you're in like Germany, I guess it's 1 p.m. for you as well anyway. Right. So 1 p.m. basically. If you've not eaten since then, you can still take the eight precepts if you want to. Otherwise, you can take the five precepts. Okay. But you can't have done anything else since then either. You've got to have been celibate and you've got to be, uh, what else? Sleep on high and yeah, but they won't have slept at that time. <laughs> as long as you're not slept on a throne after lunch, yes, you'll be no okay. Jewelry, right. No jewelry, yeah, ideally. Okay, anyway. <laughs> okay, lovely to see you all. Please just go if you need to go. Otherwise, we will unmute you and we can wave goodbye. So please uh, be unmuted and uh, we can hear your lovely voices. Bye, everyone.